The entire team at the Emsolation Podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians and cultures of the lands and seas on which we live and work. We pay our respects to all First Nations peoples, elders and ancestors. We acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and stand in solidarity towards a shared future. I personally want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I record this podcast every week, the Wurundjeri people. I recognise their continued connection to the land and waters of this beautiful place I call home. Always was, always will be. M. Rossiano. And I think maybe because I wanted to make a professional, my brain was like, ah okay, bitch, and went completely the other way. And Michael Lucas. Oh, likewise with you, can't wait. And just remember, if it's too fatty, just heat it up. This is M. Salation. I was working for Baz Luhrmann. Oh, I'll just pick that name up. Oh, no, but it, yeah, I was. You're in M. Salation. Well, hello there and welcome to M Salation. My name is M Rossiano. I'm a writer, a singer, a stand-up comedian, a maximalist power queen, a neurodivergent magic brain, and together with my best friend, Mr Michael Lucas. He's a screenwriter. He's an actor winner. He's a Logie Award winner. I bring you this podcast every week called M Salation. That's just a combination of my name, M, and the fact that it was born while we were in isolation. And then we figured m Salation has kind of become a safe space for a lot of you, a place where you can feel loved and hugged and warm and cosy and not judged. And we decided to keep the name, even though we were advised against it <laughs> by a well-meaning 40-year-old straight white bloke. I said, it's cool, cool, mate. It's okay. Thanks. I'll just follow my gut on this one. And so Emsolation is here to stay forever. You can't get rid of us. We're like herpes and glitter. Hey, uh, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody who bought a fucking hell T-shirt. What the fucking hell? We sold out in a day and, of course, as you've just heard, this T-shirt was the brainchild of, well, myself, but also Elio, my son, who is autistic and he says some pretty wild things, <laughs> some pretty magical things and pretty wild things. He says what he wants when he wants. Basically, if you have an autistic child, you know they give zero fucks and rightly so. Um, he'll say whatever the hell he wants that's on his mind, regardless of the fallout or outcome. And I know that's something that he's always going to do. <laughs> I do it too. Funny that. <laughs> But this was, uh, this hit, this struck a chord, this hit a nerve and um, I knew we needed to pop it on a T-shirt. A friend of mine actually made the prototype, Capo, who was my dresser on The Masked Singer. She bought it to my Sydney show and I said, lady, you are onto something here. Well, we did sell it out. You sold it out and we raised $5,000, which I was able to donate to the ICANN network and they provide employment opportunities and mental programs for young people. And the best part about the ICANN network is that they're autistic led. They are run by autistic people. They employ autistic people for autistic people. It's good. It's a good thing. We're going to do another run of the Fug and Hell t-shirts and then we'll be able to donate to another charity that benefits people with ASD. I also want to say <laughs> when I posted about the fact that we were donating this money and that we'd raised it, I got a lot of responses that really triggered my rejection sensitivity dysphoria and I ended up feeling badly for donating the $5,000. <laughs> I think there's a lot of well-meaning people that follow me and i I know the charity space is a hard one, which is why I'm not often in there. I make my own donations anonymously and quietly. But I always find if I mention that I want to donate some money, uh, people become very fraught and very emotional and I get all sorts of messages from all sorts of people and I, and I end up feeling quite overwhelmed and not doing anything. But I wanted to this time. I had a range of reactions I had a woman correct the way I refer to autism. She said that autistic people prefer to say um, is autistic, not has autism. And 
as the parent of an ASD child and as someone who is exploring their own autism, I just gently said to her, look, this is a language choice and I'm a part of this community and I'm not offended. And I think policing other people's language is totally unnecessary, especially if they're within that community. I would have absolutely taken the criticism if it was from a community I was not a part of. But at the moment, I'm still figuring it all out. I also had a woman comment that she felt it was a trend, all these kids being diagnosed with autism, and perhaps Elio was just a slow learner. What the fuck is hell? She was blocked. I didn't even engage. I just blocked and deleted her. And also a lot of people upset that I didn't donate to other charities. Why not this place? Why not this place? One woman said she would have preferred to see it go to reproductive health rights charities given the current state of play in America. And I just explained to her that because this is in honour of my child who uh, is autistic, that I wanted to just focus the money on charities that benefit the neurodiverse community. So <laughs> I initially, like, thought, great, we're doing this thing and everyone's going to be happy and I'll promote it because I want to do another run and I want to raise as much money as I can. And then I ended the day feeling sick and like I'd done something wrong. But it's okay. I, I you know, applied the therapy and the lessons and I talked it out with the people around me. And I really did this project from a place of love, not for love from all of you. And I have to really make sure that that's applying to a lot of the stuff that I do, that everything is from love, not for love, not pats on the bat, not for accolades. And when I reminded myself of that, it was all like, cool, people can write what they want, but I know why I did it. The money's gone to a great organisation. So, yeah, I guess I just wanted to, I just wanted to kind of point out why, and especially that area, especially the neurodiverse area, it is so neglected and everyone is just so overwrought and if there's even a sniff of some kind of relief, I think people just go in. And I'm really, really feeling that pressure around my National Press Club address. I've started feeling sick about it. <laughs> I'm avoiding writing. I, I don't know how to do this thing without letting everyone down. I'm getting teary even just talking about it now. Make a mental note, talk about it in therapy tomorrow. I'm going to do my best but I know... It's not going to be enough for many people, but all I can honestly do is say to you and just hear in my voice, I will do my best. I hope I can start it soon. It's ticking down August 24th and we are almost in July. Anyway, that's that was some good news and then just an explanation. And again, just thank you and look out for the next drop of the next round of Fuggin' Hell t-shirts. I also want to give a bit of a trigger warning to this episode. We do talk about abortion. We do talk about Roe versus Wade. I wanted to let you all know how conflicted I'd been around having, you know, seeing a lot of women sharing their traumatic abortion stories. And not all abortion stories are traumatic and therein lies the problem. You know, I don't want women feeling like they have to share their stories in, as a way of justifying or proving that abortions are, you know, a vital part of reproductive health care rights. But also the fact that people don't talk about it kind of shrouds it in shame and and so it's, I've been feeling really conflicted about it. Michael and I really, really dive into that. And um, I understand that this would have really been upsetting for so many of you. So I just wanted to give you a bit of a warning. We, we try to handle it with care, uh, but it, I found it deeply upsetting and, and I can imagine a lot of you have also. I'm going to be on the project this Friday night, the 1st of July, if you care to have a little, little watch. But I'll remind you of that at the end of the show. It's a long episode. We know you love that. I think we've nearly hit an hour, maybe even more now. I've gone on for eight minutes in this intro. Enjoy it. Tell a friend. And um, I hope you're all okay. It's been, it's been a, it's been a, bit of a shit fight lately, hasn't it? Like I say in the podcast, I'm just longing for some precedented times. All right, gang, play the music. M. Luciano and Michael Lucas. This is M. Salation. Well, it finally got him. Guess what, bitch? <laughs> Coronavirus! 
coming to us live from his isolation period, Mr. Logies himself. <laughs> Kavina is in the house. How are you feeling? Oh, my goodness. It finally got you. <laughs> it finally got me. Mm-hmm. It finally got me. I did walk back from the Gold Coast with a Logie and also a coronavirus infection. <laughs> a Logie and a Lurgy, if you will. I can't <laughs> oh, believe you. Thank you. Snap. Professional comedian. Here's my five-star review. Yes. You did, and it turns out the Logies was the super spreader. Who else has got it? I mean, I know I certainly know of a few people that I, you know. All those people? Well, we had to do, yeah, we once did a Zoom with a lot of people from the ABC, and there's always like about 25 people whenever you do a Zoom with the ABC, and so many of them were out with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you have indeed taken out half the newsreader office. I have. Office. Yeah. I, have. Mm. I think I now fall into the category of COVID villain. You are an evil, evil nerd. Because... <laughs> I knowingly went to the Logies, went to an after party. And also we get tested three times a week mm. on the newsreader and it wasn't enough. I went, I was in meetings all week and um, I have infected. And the worst thing about I'm very fortunate. I like had the mildest of symptoms for maybe 24 hours oh. and now I just feel complete. I know. I, I, can't, I don't, can't explain it. I'm hoping it's just still not about to hit me. Um, I don't think so, though. It's, it, it, but then in addition to that, not only am I really, like, feel pretty normal, I've also got the run of my house to myself. I've, with, I've got about 800 gourmet cafes within, like, Uber Eats, 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I've been spending $17 getting, like, one little beautiful green juice sent to oh, my And the people you. that I infected us... <laughs> Um, some of them really not well and then also a lot of them living with families and everything so they're holed up in these little hell holes. Yes. And I'm just strutting around thinking, oh, do I want an organic cookie or should I like, it's terrible. Uh, you are the worst. Yeah, he called me, I think you were only 72 hours in and you said to me, did you do the whole the whole isolation in your room because I am walking circles around my three-storey enormous townhouse and I just don't know what to do with myself. That's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I do like, feel guilty, you don't. sort you of. You do not. <laughs> what a charmed experience you've had, goodness me. So when are you out? When do you? When have you finished your Friday. Class? I've oh. got days more of this. Oh. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still working, though. I mean, everything's set up for Zoom, so I'm still doing very full days. Yes, well, I see you are working. Well, we've all had our problems. I had an iron level of 11, which is just, it's not great. So my doctor called me and said, come in, you need a transfusion because I had convinced myself I had cancer and I just walked in and I said, I've got a lot of bruises on my leg and I've got a rash and I'm exhausted. I saw those bruises on the Gold Coast. It's why we were were micromanaging when and where you were swimming and at what times (laughs) because of the bruises. Yes. And the sea lice rash. I mean, this, we're going into too much detail. It was, was it sea lice? Was it cancer? Because if you put into Google tired bruises and a rash, it's oh, 19 you different... Just get, <laughs> it's cancer. You just get a picture of Shelby from Still yeah. Magnolia. Shelby, Shelby, you need some juice. You need some juice. Pretty much. It's cancer. And so I walked into my doctor, Dr Jamie, who is a fabulous gay man who also went to our high school, 10 years our junior, and um, he very much knows me, knows my um, penchant for the dramatics. And I said, Jamie, I think I've got leukaemia. He's like, okay, well, why don't we just do a little test for a few different things? And ironically, I always blame low iron for everything. Like I would blame low iron for a toothache. In my life has been known, there's two things that my kids know. If they've got a tummy ache, they'll be asked, have you done a poo? And mm. if they scratch anywhere below the belly button, they probably have worms. And mm-hmm. if there's any other symptom, how's your iron levels? They're the three known facts. Are they expected to answer that? Yes. Are they expected to know? Yeah, show me the, the whites of your eyes. Of iron levels? Show me the whites of your eyes. Oh, show me the whites okay. of your eyes. Show me the yeah. These are un, un yeah unscientific ways. And yet, the one time it was severely affecting your own life for some reason. You didn't, didn't know. go there. Didn't okay. know. So I got the blood test back and he called me like within 12 hours mm. and I saw his number and I picked up and I said, oh, my God, oh, my God, is it cancer? He's like, no, Em, you're anemic. Can you please come to the practice and have a transfusion? <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, I can't believe it's low iron. I always blame iron. I can't believe I didn't this time. So 
I is went it in. a transfusion or an infusion? Like, what is it? Do they know. take? I, do they put a whole I lot of blood a, of other people I, in there? Oh, infusion! Isn't it a transfer of iron to my blood? Is it infusion? Is that what I you call? I don't know. I, I, when I think transfusion, I think a whole lot of people have donated blood, and you're oh, getting it put in you. Infusion, then. So okay. they put a drip in your arm, full yeah. of, oh, and they hang a thing around your neck, and it's spring loaded, and yeah. it and it feeds the iron into your arm. So. I've had my eye in and I already feel better. It's not supposed to kick in for six days or so, but I do already feel better. And then I went down an ADHD iron deficiency rabbit hole and it turns out there's a bunch of studies that have been done, obviously not on adult women because why would anyone bother, but some adults and the blind studies showed that a high majority of the ADHD candidates were anemic. And there is ah. a distinct link between lack of iron in blood and ADHD because Odie... Really? Yes. Odie had to have a transfusion, a transfusion, what do we call it? An infusion. infusion I was calling it, but I mean, iron. I don't know. I'm yes. not an iron specialist, clearly. She came up as anemic about two months ago and had to go straight in and have one. So, and she has ADHD. And this is a whole thing, but there's not enough research. There's a little bit. I've been looking, but, of course, there's not enough. But it's wild to me that that is just its a symptom of ADHD is anemia. Hi there. I'm Dr. Megan Jurett, naturopathic doctor. So today I wanted to talk to you about ADHD and iron deficiency. So iron is actually a requirement for tyrosine hydroxylase. It's a cofactor. So as you can see there, tyrosine hydroxylase is required to get tyrosine to turn into L-dopa, and then L-dopa will be converted to dopamine. So if we are have in, if we have insufficient iron stores, then we don't have enough cofactor to activate tyrosine hydroxylase, and then the whole dopamine production pathway gets a little altered. So, and they've also done crossover studies actually between ADHD children and control subjects who don't have ADHD, and they found that there was a much higher prevalence of iron deficiency in the ADHD population than the controls. So if you have ADHD, iron deficiency could be a co-contributing factor. So make sure you get your ferritin stores checked and you get an iron panel done from your doctor. Ah! Yeah. I know. There you go. Crazy. I know. So, look, it's been... You do look infused Thank from you. my vantage point. Thank you. I've pressed And it's else. not just the filters that I know you've set beautifully <laughs> on this camera. There's no filters. Um, no, I've also, like, started doing skincare proper. That's why my skin... Look at my skin. Oh, look at I my know. skin. I saw... Look, look I'm sitting around on the couch every day. I'm not too busy to see your stories. Look at my skin. You sat opposite me the day after the Logies and you said to me, you look glo- You are glowing. Yeah. Retinal. Yeah. Yeah, I am started using not just shampoo on my face. And I'll tell you right now... <laughs> <laughs> it works. It works. The system works. I've become obsessed with a particular TikToker and she is this fantastic trans woman and her face is incredible and she, she talks you through all her steps. She calls herself Barbie, which obviously I'm in. Yes, I cuss a lot. If you don't like it, fuck off. This is my page. The vibe is always Barbie this, Barbie that, but today the vibe is just Barbie. And she mm. drops all the serums on her face like someone's like exploded um, jizz on her. Yeah. So straight away, two two things, check, check for me. Yeah. And she started talking about her skincare routine and she was recommending products and I just went and bought every single thing she recommended Yeah. and I started doing it. I mean, it's a 21-step program and I'll probably only hyperfixate on it so I'm probably only going to look good for the next, I don't know, five weeks until I get bored. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it really works. It burns a bit. I don't know if it's supposed to burn but okay. I look really good so I'm just copping the burning and I can't go out in the sunlight without like a mosquito net over my face. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's the downside of retinol. It makes your skin super sensitive. Oh, yeah. I am a Cullen. I'm I'm effectively (laughs) Edward Cullen's sister. I sparkle in the light. I'm so luminous. But if I get in the light, it will burn me until I am dead. It's like diamonds. You're beautiful. Mm, So, (laughs) yeah, they're all the things that have been going on. Look, there's no way around talking about Roe v. Wade. And trust me... (laughs) I didn't want to. It's obviously hugely triggering for a lot of women and it's terrifying and I feel like, I mean, I'm just longing for some precedented times. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) (laughs) Give me some precedented times, please. Look, at least we have recently in Australia had perhaps a slightly more optimistic time politically. If we were in the absolute shitty here, this would be even more <laughs> horrifically... Mm, it's true. ..horrifically depressing than it is. But 
we must not rest because things can change very quickly mm. on the political landscape. We must always remember that right now, yep, there is a, a political party in place that will protect Australian women's abortion and reproductive health rights. But things can change, as the states have found out. So on Friday, the US Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, effectively wiping out 50 years of abortion rights in America, ending legal access to abortion in over half of the states, and basically indicating a successful far-right radicalisation of the Supreme Court. I mean, there's no other way to put it. No, and that was always what Trump was promising he could deliver to the right-wingers, even though we well and truly know he's on record in the 90s as saying that he was pro-choice. So it's not something he believes personally, but it was no. a way for him to garner strong support, and he yeah. has bitterly delivered for them. Oh. So Roe v. Wade, and I'm going to explain it in case you're not across it. I was across it, but not to the extent I am now. And it's been said a lot. And I think a lot of assumed knowledge happens. So I found it interesting. In 1969, a 25-year-old single woman named Norma McClawvey became pregnant in Texas. And she didn't want to proceed with the pregnancy. But in Texas, abortions were only permitted if the mother's life was at risk. So she filed a lawsuit under the synonym Jane Roe on behalf of herself and others challenging the law. Now, her case was initially rejected, so she gave birth to that child. She then appealed the ruling and it ended up going before the Supreme Court and it was argued by lawyers that the abortion laws in Texas and Georgia were unconstitutional and infringed on the women, a woman's right to privacy. Seven to two judges voted in her favour. Um, now, the Wade part of Roe versus Wade was Henry Wade and he was the defendant and he was the Dallas County District Attorney. So it was a landmark decision and it only legalised abortions in the first trimester. The Supreme Court then left it up to the other states to decide what would happen in the second and third. So it, it wasn't like across the board. I've been really conflicted about seeing women tell their traumatic abortion stories almost as a way to prove and justify why we deserve access to safe and legal abortions. Mm. No one owes anyone that. And mm. I would support a woman's right to an abortion if it was just a decision she was making because at that time in her life it's, it's not right. I support her right to it as much as I support a woman who's having to have a medical one because something's happened to the fetus or her life is in mm -hmm. danger. And I think that's what the word universal means, right? It, it's for everybody. And I keep seeing these women telling these horrifically traumatic stories, you know, and then ending it with, and that's why it's important. And I just want to say to them, girlfriend, you don't have to do that. Like you don't have to justify your abortion mm -hmm. or, or the, the need for abortions and the need for, for reproductive health rights for women. But then the other part of me is like, no, but we should be talking about it. Because the reason there's so much shame around this is that people don't realise how common they are. Mm. And if we spoke about it more, you know, it's up there in the category of secret women's business. With, mm. You know, we don't talk about miscarriages and periods and, and menopause and pubic hair on our boobs. You know, obviously these are all different scales of things, but there just seems to be this another adding into the shame bubble that surrounds just existing as a woman. Mm. We should be talking more about terminations, but we don't, like, so you know, can you see what I mean? Like I've been yeah. really sitting in this discomfort. You shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to offer all of that. But at the same time, we'd probably be living in a much more balanced society if people did feel yeah. that it was, if, if it didn't feel so stigmatised or like something that you should keep, quiet, you should keep quiet. Yeah. And I want to, like, categorically state everyone has their right to a belief and an opinion as long as that belief and opinion doesn't affect someone else. So if you are personally against abortion because of religious reasons or whatever, don't get one. Yeah. You don't have the right to stop someone else because of what you believe. I've had to disengage from Twitter and I've had to disengage from everything because of, you know, the, the rhetoric around it and how traumatic it is. I can only imagine how bad it's been for, a, a, for so many women. But the one thing I haven't disengaged from is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez... AOC, yeah. just going fierce, man. Have you seen no, no, what... She's been on fire this week. A party and individuals who claim to protect the lives of children just weeks after over a dozen children died in Texas now claim to support their life. 
the lies of the young. Who are we protecting? Who does this protect? No one. <laughs> she's always great in, I mean, it's terrible to say she's always great at the worst times, but, but she's often the voice that we need. And she always, there's something about these incredibly distressing times that she finds such clarity and, and she's so succinct and sharp and slays it. She has. She's called upon Joe Biden to impeach some of the justices, specifically Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch. Gorsuch? Neil Gorsuch. Neil Gorsuch, Gorsuch yeah. for lying about their views around Roe versus Wade when they were being... The, the, yeah, the Supreme Court hearings. They the sit hearings, down and they all it, get yes. asked questions and they totally crafted all of these words to just basically say we consider this set of law and, mm. yeah, to totally reassure people... You know, and there were some, I mean, I don't think any Democrat believed that that was their stance, but there were a few of those sort of slightly more centrist Republicans like Susan Collins that said, well, I believe that they, I took them at their word and, and voted for them when they might not have. Mm. I mean, the whole process of the Supreme Court, how those judges got in, what they said to get in and everything like that is so ridiculous. And the fact that it could put them in a position where they could make this decision that's so against the popular majority is just, it's wild in a democracy that this yeah. Yeah. Well, and also the Democrats have been just wringing their hands and reading poems, you know. Mm. So Nancy Pelosi, she didn't read the room. You know, she, she read this poem out. I have no other country, even though my land is burning. Only a word in Hebrew penetrates my veins, my soul with an aching body and with a hungry heart. Here is my home. I will not be silent, for my country has changed her face country has changed her face. I shall not give up on her. I shall remind her and sing into her ears until she opens her eyes. And it's like, you know, saying you don't recognise your country and clutching your pearls and just there's not a lot of action, which is what AOC is saying. She's saying like, you need to open clinics on federal land in the states where it's banned. There needs to be action here now from the Democrats. Mm. And instead of just standing around going, oh, this is so bad, this is so bad. But Biden's not going to impeach them because to impeach a Supreme Court judge, you have to have two thirds of the majority of the Senate and they have to vote yes. And they, Democrats have the House, but they only have half of the Senate. And so Kamala can be the tiebreaker, tiebreaker. as the VP, but Joe Biden knows they wouldn't get it through. It's not enough. So there's no way these judges are going to be impeached. And the only way judges can leave is if they die. I know, well, it's the most ridiculous system. <laughs> Like, you can't get rid of them. There should be set terms and they should be much, much shorter. Agreed. Like, that's uh, that seems so archaic. I am here till it's a blood oath. It's it's a life oath. Oh, and Clarence Thomas, who who is one of the most right-wing ones, who's who's the one that's declared, well, after this we'll have to look into gay marriage and all those other things. I mean, he was in the Anita Hill hearings in the 90s. Okay, and just a little side quest reset here. Anita Hill in 1991 testified that Clarence Thomas, who at the time was a Supreme Court nominee, had sexually harassed her when he was chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and she'd worked there as an advisor to him. Now, it's the first time anyone had testified like that before the Supreme Court and ultimately he was confirmed, but she still to this day stands by letting them know what kind of person she felt he was. And I just wanted to do that for you because I hate listening to podcasts and something gets mentioned and then I have to go away and Google it. So in case you didn't remember, in case you're not a huge political nerd, that is the Anita Hill Michael has just referred to. Back to the pod. He has been a sort of a stain on American life for decades and decades and decades, with decades still to come. I it's know. He's, he said we're going to look into gay marriage and we're going to look into birth control. Notably not interracial marriage because he himself is in an interracial, an interracial marriage. marriage. He left that one off. Yes. So, look, it's easy to sit in Australia and say, oh, we're safe, we're fine, but... I think this is a reminder to always stay vigilant because in South Australia, it was illegal until 2021. Like, that's only a mm. year ago. Mm. In West Australia, it's still in the criminal codes. It mm. hasn't been taken out. Mm. We're not as advanced and progressive as we like to think in Australia. Oh, well, it also shows the importance of, I mean, when Obama got in, he was saying he was going to codify it. 
mm. in American law, which he had the ability to do, but then that was sort of seen as this technicality and he put it on the back burner and mm. like that's ruined things. So it, that, it also shows that, yeah, you can't leave those archaic things. Nope. Like you're right, we do have some outdated laws and we do need to change them yeah. in the future. Life. And then you have people like Matt Canavan tweeting congratulatory messages to Republican senators and candidates because he was so glad that the abortion law was overturned. He is, you know, he's mm. here. He's in our country. He's in our political system. So I'm just saying unicorn of, you know, death is not predicting anything, but she's saying no. be alert and be alarmed, you she know? Is. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah. She's yeah. strutting around the edges of her sparkling yeah. yard saying she's yeah. on guard. <laughs> but I also just want to say to anyone, anyone who has been triggered by all of this talk, um, be gentle with yourself, talk to friends and family, see a therapist, talk to your doctor, because it will have brought up a lot of things for a lot of women. Um, it's, a, it's no little girl dreams of having a termination, but it's a reality for many, many, many women, more women than you could possibly imagine. Mm. And having it so publicly discussed and in such negative ways in some instances would be very, very traumatic. Um, mm. So I just want to say, I, you know, as always, I see you and be gentle and go gently and talk about it if you can and if that will help you. But, yeah, it's, fuck, it's been fucked. Fuck. It's fucked. And also it's, I remember that horrible, shocked, sickly feeling when Trump was elected. And I think at the kernel of that was we've grown up all our lives thinking of America as this progressive place that's the superpower and we're lucky to have this democratic progressive superpower. And at that moment it felt like, is this the fall of the empire? And... When something like this happens, when they go back 50 years, mm. it it really feels like it is. Like mm. the age of, of America, American exceptionalism is over and then what's the other superpower? Like China, Russia? It's a scary, it's yeah. a scary position to be in. Truly, absolutely. All right, we're going to go away. We're going to come back and talk about, look, something far more frivolous the Barbie movie. More photos oh have been released. Oh, <laughs> that's next. M. Rossiano and Michael Lucas. This is, 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 is M. Salation. Well, Michael Lucas, today you sent me one of the most visually stunning images I think I've ever seen. If you wish to describe... To everyone I when knew you it would me. spark joy. As soon oh. as I said, it was just one of those things that I didn't need to write a caption. <laughs> I just needed to make sure the image was in your eyeballs. Mm -hmm. It is a picture that mm -hmm. looks very much like it was taken in Los Angeles on the uh, near the sea somewhere, um, and it is of Margot Robbie <laughs> and Ryan Gosling oh. as Barbie and Ken. Hi, Barbie. And in this particular image, <laughs> they are rollerblading. Yes, they are rollerblading. And they are wearing the most fluorescent ensemble. There's pinks, there's blues. My goodness, is there yellows. Oh, it's heaven. They're wearing the most heavenly knee pads. He has a fluorescent yellow bum bag. It is just ex mm. an extraordinary image. Oh, it is an orgasm for the eyeballs. I'll tell you right now. The Barbie movie is, look, I don't know how I'm going to, I don't know how I'm going to last until July when it comes out next year. Also, I'm going to apologise right now for who I'm going to become when that movie comes out because mm. <laughs> I think it's just going to be a little overwhelming for me. I grew up loving Barbie. Like, but I was always given Skipper because she was the only brunette, right? But as mm. the Italian, hairy, brown-eyed, brown-haired, like, I just wanted to be Barbie. I had, the, I had the Barbie dream house. So I had Castle Grayskull and I had the Barbie dream house and I made Skeletor marry Barbie because I thought Skeletor was <gasps> way hotter than Ken. Well, I always knew Ken was gay. Like, I'm like, Barbie, oh, okay. Barbie deserves, I, even then I knew Barbie deserved a good deep dicking, right? And I mm. feel like Skeletor was going to work harder than Ken to give Barbie an orgasm. Oh, he would have. I think Skeletor <laughs> knew what he was doing in oh. that regard. Skeletor was another, like, sexual awakening for me. Skeletor knew what he was doing. A heart stopper moment. Skeletor. <laughs> <laughs> that is truly yeah. disturbing. <laughs> he was a lot shorter than Barbie, but... Oh, that doesn't matter. Would have worked even harder, right? Oh, like, we. I also participated in, I, it, it will not surprise you to hear, I too loved Barbie as a child. Oh. But my love of it had to be 
a bit more kept under the radar because it distressed my father. Oh. Yeah, so I obviously, I of course owned Castle Grayskull and Snake Mountain and all of those sort of things, but my access to Barbie was through my cousin Laurie who was like four years older than me and she had it all. And so when yes. I went to Laurie's house to stay over, it was like I got to enter the Barbie world. Oh. But we still crossbred. But with us it was more Star Wars figures. <laughs> and, I, and they're even smaller. I still remember a wedding between Barbie and Yoda and looking at it thinking, this oh. is, they're an odd couple. <laughs> Help you again? Yes. Mm. That's borderline bestiality by Barbie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was a pretty, it was a pretty strange sight. That he might have been the celebrant. I'm not sure. I but would prefer I, Yoda to be the celebrant in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. I would have, yeah, there was a lot of cross relationships going on for me. And then when Jem came on the scene, Jem is truly, yeah, yeah, just, when Jem came on the scene, like, I don't know, I just felt like she and Barbie, I remember distinctively wanting her and Barbie to date. But being conflicted, oh, like, okay. like, because my mum had a lot of lesbian friends, and Bridget, who you knew, specifically a nurse, and Bridget would come with her girlfriend, and I just remember thinking, why can't Jem and Barbie be girlfriends? Because that would be a hot couple, by the way. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But anyway, the Barbie movie is coming, and development started on this in two thousand and nine. By the way, like it's been oh, bubbling. there has been at one point it was starring Amy Schumer. I think. <laughs> It was. I. It is so riveting. But what's really riveting about it is the team that it's ended up with is oh, really compelling. I know. So Margot Robbie's playing Barbie, obviously. Ryan Gosling is playing Ken. Will Ferrell is playing the CEO of a toy company. And then the cast, some of the casting is so exciting. Kate McKinnon, obviously from SNL, uh, the guy from Shang-Chi, Simu Liu, Ugly Betty's America Ferreira, Michael Serra, and also the girl who plays Maeve in Sex Education, Emma McKay. Mm-hmm. I've always said she looks like Margot Robbie. I've even made face compilations of the two of them. Maeve mm. from Sex Education and Margot Robbie look like twin sisters. And, and I've wow. always wanted them in the same film. Like, but that was never going to happen. And then, oh, my gosh, it's happening. You've been heard. Yeah. And written by Greta Gerwig. Which is amazing. Okay, so that's what's got me Talk incredibly about intrigued. Yeah. Well, Greta Gerwig directed Little Women and yeah. wrote Little Women, which yeah. we completely love. And she also directed what was that amazing film that we saw beforehand with um, Saoirse Ronan, um, um, Oh, God. Lady, what? So, Lady Bird. Lady Bird. Yeah, yeah, Lady yeah. Bird. Yeah. So she, this is a very unexpected project for her. Yeah. She yeah. is um, known for her indie and feminist films. Mm. And I think you'd have to say Barbie, for all of her glamorous qualities, is not. Uh, like, sorry, what? Uh, is sorry, not what? perceived as a feminist icon. I, I beg your pardon? How fucking <laughs> dare you? Barbie Some has would been... say she's caused oh. a lot of damage to girls. Barbie has been an astronaut, the president, a teacher, a doctor, a fashion designer, a stay-at-home mum. She's a feminist talk on. She well, was a working woman. She was a president, Michael. Well, and launched a million cases of bulimia, right? Oh, I mean, yes. <laughs> can you Everything honestly say that you didn't compare your body to Barbie's? Oh. Is it healthy to give little girls that physique? Why do you have to ruin Everything with logic and fact. Like, well, I think that that's what people would say, but I know that Greta Gerwig would be switched onto that and would have an interesting response to that. And I think Margot as well would would be attuned to that. So I'm just, it just seems like such a challenge. And, How? And, How yeah. can they do it? And also co-written by Noah Baumbach. Yeah, who I wrote know. Marriage Story. <laughs> yeah, so, it is wild. <laughs> it's wild. And I don't, I don't understand. How they're going to, because initially everyone's like, oh, it's a Barbie movie, so obviously you know what this is about. And Margot very much looks like Barbie. Like she's playing the blonde, stunning, no body fat, mm. you know, traditional Barbie looking Barbie. And Brian Gosling looks like Freddie Prince Jr. and Ellen had a child. Um, <laughs> and- Do you find him attractive as Ken? Because I really don't. No. I don't. He Are really does joking? My ideal man is Ragnar Lothbrok. You think I'm going to find Ken attractive? Well, they're both blonde. But, I mean, <laughs> I found him attractive when, when, what was the one he did with Emma Stone? Crazy Stupid Love. He was super attractive in oh. that. And he kind of looked like Ken. But True. now they've, like, now they've, that was the one where she looked at his abs and she went, there was a little Photoshop, that one. <laughs> That's but right. with that blonde hair and goofy grin, I'm not so sure. Yeah, no, look, I, I'm not into that either. But everyone has said who's working on the film, oh, just wait, just you wait. But I don't, 
I, unless they're wielding some magic, I don't know how they're going to reinvent and revamp the fact that unless Barbie has some kind of identity crisis and I'll tell you fucking what, if the villain is a brunette because I have sat through 27 animated Barbie movies, okay? I'll tell you right now. <laughs> I, <laughs> Barbie and the 12 Dancing Princesses, Barbie in a Mermaid's oh. Tale, where Barbie stars as Merlia, a teenage stripping champion who discovers a terrifying family secret. She's a mermaid and then she decides to save her mother from the evil heiress who's brunette. Every single <laughs> villainess is brunette. So, I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> and you say this hasn't scarred you. Oh, wow, I have been scarred. You're right. You have. <laughs> and you have experimented with blonde in your life, as have I. I think we should send those pictures through. <laughs> <laughs> we were teenagers in the 90s. It was basically, mm. as I've said also, it was a lot of sun in and lemon juice until I figured out I wouldn't cut it for my ethnic hair. So then when we bought the bleach and we were all walking around looking like, like um, dehydrated ducklings. Is the oh, only- <laughs> yeah. And I would spike it. Uh, and so I get, and it would take so much cheap Coles <laughs> hair gel, Tuffed. and I would twist and spike to just to get that in sync look. Oh yes, and the tight shell necklace, and just some of the regrowth. I also like wanted to shave a line in my eyebrow. Remember, remember the people oh, yeah. were shaving lines yeah, in their yeah, eyebrows. Yeah, of yeah, course, of yeah, course, nah. of course. Like Luke Perry. I know. I still, even when I submit the pictures, there's still a part of me that hopes people will go. You know what? That looks not too bad. You should consider it now. No, it looks no terrible. No one ever does. No, it looks so bad on both of us. Like just some people are not meant to be blonde and you and I are in that category I'll tell you right now. Damn it, because I was hoping in this moment you go, let's do it again, the two of us, right now. No, no, I am not doing it again. I'm not. I'm trying to grow my hair out. I'm trying to adhere to society's preconceived notions of beauty standards for women. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst also promoting the Barbie movie. Listen, everything is problematic. And I refuse to fall into a category of A or B. It's A to Z. And I can yeah. hold my love of Barbie and all the campness attached. And she was a fucking astronaut. astronaut Barbie. And also acknowledge that it's an unrealistic stereotype sold to girls my age that cause a lot of problems. And I hold them <laughs> side by side and hold them and mother them both. And don't Did make all of you your choose. children like Barbie equally? Yes. Yeah. How's they Elio did. going? Elio. Elio is more into the... Dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's really into minions at the moment as well. Okay. But there is a great villain in the minion movie, which is technically Despicable Me 4, mm. voiced by Sandra Bullock called oh, yeah. Scarlet... Scarlet... What's her last name, Chella? Eagle. No, Scarlet Overkill. And she's fabulous. Scarlet Overkill, like, wears a, a red lip and a thigh high boot, and it's like got an amazing red dress, and he loves Scarlet Overkill. So there's oh, still he's hope. And his first fabulous yeah. woman. Doesn't it feel so good to be bad? Yeah, so I think there's still hope, but no, I haven't quite gotten him into Barbies yet. There's just so much dinosaur content happening. We've just discovered the David Attenborough one that he did for Apple oh, TV, yeah. mm-hmm. Prehistoric Planet. Oh, mm-hmm. my God. It's pretty brutal, though. Like one of the baby T-Rexes gets eaten in the first 30 seconds and it's really teaching Elio a valuable lesson about his own mortality. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd known. A full-grown T-Rex is the planet's most powerful predator. <laughs> Yeah, he must be across the Lion King at this point. I mean, he's used to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, we also have to watch Hulk as a T-Rex but with Spider-Man logos fight Thor dinosaur but with um, uh, what's, the, uh, what's the lizard, the big lizard's Godzilla's back attached and they fight to the death. And wow. that's, what, that's what I'm watching on YouTube. So, oh, he also likes watching hamsters run through, like, mazes. They're really cute. So there's a balance. Okay. Right. <laughs> That's now, good. look, before before you go, what have you been watching? What have you been eyeballing since you've been in... Uh... I have watched uh, on Disney Plus um, Fire Island. This week is sacred. We're going to Fire Island. And this is why straight people hate us. And also heteronormativity, Judeo-Christian pathology, anal. <gasps> Which is a very I haven't gay... seen it yet. Yeah, I know. I know. We we did have it locked in for our Gold Coast weekend, but in the end we were overstimulated. With J-Lo. <laughs> and J-Lo was all we could handle. We <laughs> just had to watch the halftime show 800 times. Am I right in saying it's the gay remake of Pride and Prejudice? You are correct. So, um, so really, 
right on brand for me. Hi, gay. It's a bullseye. <laughs> it's a bullseye. And so Fire Island is this island off, I think, the coast of New York and, and it's where on Pride Week it gets completely overtaken Pride Month, I should say, completely overtaken by the gays. Mm-hmm. becomes an, almost an exclusively gay yeah, island and everyone amazing. hooks up and maybe falls in love but more likely <laughs> has a lot of sex. <laughs> and it's written by a US comedian, Joel Kim Booster, and Bowen Yang from SNL is in it. Mm-hmm. Margaret Cho is in it. Mm. And, um, yeah, they, they do Elizabeth and Mr Darcy but set in this hyper, hyper gay world. And... Uh, yeah, I think there are many. I mean, it'll just make you want to do Fire Island. And Margaret Cho's character, she's known as sort of the gay sort of den mother. She owns the house that they come and stay with and sort of makes food and takes them to all of their, like, <laughs> their events and looks after them when they've had drug overdoses and everything. And it's a good future for you. <laughs> <laughs> Future gay den mother. I'm sorry. As I if it's not wait. the present. No, I, oh, I'm excited. So how many cock rings out of five are you giving it? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a solid four from me. I love oh. a contemporary adaptation of Jane Austen. I mean, Clueless, obviously, one of the all-time greats. Yeah, and I think Austen always hoped that her story would centre around a lot of ketamine and um, yeah. anal sex. I just feel like... She'd be happy yeah, with that. I think she would be. <laughs> <think she'd> be <laughs> she always envisioned a scene where one gay gets a whole lot of cheese out of the fridge and the other gays heavily, strenuously question their choice considering what the rest of the night is going <laughs> to entail. It's absolutely what the writer who created Elizabeth Bennett was dreaming of. <laughs> so you've got to get onto it. I can't wait. That alone has got me on board. I have been watching The Umbrella Academy, the final season. Mm. Um, I've been smashing it and it's so great. It is the most camp, stylized, ridiculous, amazing series I think I've ever watched. It's just, it's really like someone went into my head and just, it, and it shouldn't make sense, but it does. Mm-hmm. But specifically this season, everyone was really interested to see how Elliot Page acts in Umbrella Academy and obviously Elliot is a trans man mm-hmm. and all the other seasons featured Elliot playing Vanya before he had transitioned. And so the character, Vanya, was still Vanya mm-hmm. and now the, the actor, he is male and how are they going to make that happen? Mm. And I can report it is done in the most beautiful, touching, well-handled way. Like it is just I I cried. I cried watching it. And you're not meant to cry watching The Umbrella Academy because it's absurd. It's not that sort of show, right? No, it's not. But there's just a moment where each family member kind of takes in the news. It's in the second episode. Oh, yeah, we'll play a little bit. Where's Luther? Who cares? Probably out for a run. Mm. Love the haircut. So uh, I, uh, I talked to Marcus last night. Wait, what? You talked with the enemy by yourself? Yeah, well, somebody had to do something. Who elected you, Vanya? It's uh, Victor. Who's Victor? I am. It's who I've always been. Uh, is that an issue for anyone? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good with it. Yeah, me too. Cool. So essentially, and I imagine acting that for Elliot would have been quite fresh because he has done that in his own life. Mm. But I imagine he was able to, with the writers, create the ultimate coming out experience for a trans person in that every family member embraced it um, and it wasn't a big deal. It was just Mm. like, oh, cool, are you happy? We're happy we love your hair. It, 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 truly, <laughs> it was, I don't know, I just want to I just want to let anyone know if you have a trans kid or a, 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 a your trans or, or it's just, it's so nice to see it depicted in not a traumatic way. Do you mm, know what I mean? Mm. It's, it's just, I imagine the same way you might feel watching a normalised rom-com with two same-sex leads, right? Now yeah. it's just becoming... I would think this would be a relief for trans people to watch this and it not be steeped in mm. heavy trauma. A story of rejection. Yeah, 
Yeah, so pain. Mm. it's I I was I think they're ending it after this, but I just was so happy for Elliot in terms of it would have been a wonderful thing to act and oh and the the way the whole show's handled it and the cast handled it. Oh my god! Anyway, that's what I've been. And watching. So it's just one of the best things about working in TV is when when shows go for many years and you know life marches on for everyone making it, including the cast, and then when mm. you have to all come together as a collective to figure out sometimes events in people's lives do have to be interpreted on screen. Mm. And and you end up feeling so close to everyone when you do all mm. of that and when you figure out, when you work together collaboratively to figure out how do we turn this into gold? What is yeah. the best way to, mm. and it's like on one hand it's like let's use it. and But if you use it with, with, with you know, empathy and, and, and you know, try and find bring as much creativity and inspiration to it. It can be so great. So I almost want to start watching Umbrella Academy so I can see that moment. So How many moved. seasons is it? Is this five? Yeah, this is five. You'll like it. Is you it based will on like books? It. Is it based on books? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it's, it's my favourite character's Klaus and if you watch it you'll very quickly understand why. But right. it's it's one of my all-time favourite series and it's sat quite quietly. Like It hasn't had a huge amount of press. It's just, I think it's outstanding. It's someone who loves the genre of superheroes and fantasy. It's really, but it's also weird. It's truly bonkers in mm. the best possible way. So I, I, I love it and I highly recommend people watch it if you haven't seen it. I've also been watching um, Drag Race has finally released the French arm, um, Drag Race France, and episode one, I just want to say there was a drag queen wearing a Thierry Mugler-inspired breastplate, balancing champagne on her head, playing saxophone in front of Jean-Paul Gaultier, and it was the most French thing I've ever seen. And I just <laughs> can't the French drag queens don't give any fucks. They're wonderful. It's kind of a return to before drag became quite mainstream and gentrified, you know, in terms of American drag race. And it's all very family friendly now and they don't really swear. And it's it's really watered down from the original drag race, which is great and fine and making it more consumable for a broader range of people. But French drag race you're, don't you're give a fuck. You're glad to be back with oh. you don't give a fuck, people. <laughs> I don't know. I give a fuck. It's so great. So that's what I've been watching. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope you get better. I mean, you already are. So um, didn't even have Thank a runny you. nose. Yeah, no, that's. I know. I'm so sorry. No, I'm glad. I was <laughs> worried. Oh, no, Look, no. Look, fingers crossed. I mean, I you know, you never know. And Touch I know with. some people that had very mild infections and then it stayed with them for a while. So I hope yep. that's not the case with me. Not at all. All right. Talk soon. Bye. Bye. This is Emsolation. Well, my pals, that is it from us. You're off to watch The Umbrella Academy, aren't you? There's only three seasons of The Umbrella Academy, by the way. Uh, my teller has asked me to put that in. And the TikToker I was talking about, her handle is XOXO Emira, E M I R A. She is the skincare guru, the person I've been looking to. And so many of you have been commenting on my skin, I have to say. So I'm probably going to have to film a tutorial. Full disclosure, I get Botox between my brows. I absolutely am not going to tell you that that's a serum or anything. I, I once tried egg whites. Don't do that. I once tried egg whites all over my thighs because I was worried about like a tiny bit of cellulite when I was like 19. God, I would give anything for those legs again. And I remember I popped on some egg whites on the area that I felt was flawed, thinking, you know, that it would tighten it. And then I forgot to wash it off. And when I lay in the sun... When I lay in the sun, it looked, look, I don't even know how to describe this without it being incredibly offensive. It was a combination of like snail trails with dried egg whites and semen. It, and it didn't smell great either. So it didn't work. But I do get Botox between my brows. I also get like, um, I get microdermabrasion done as often as you're allowed. I get monthly facials. My face is my business, like it's everywhere. So I do invest in it. And I've only just started with the routine. So I, I wash my face twice with oil wash. I've got a gel wash. I do retinol at night, vitamin C, moisturizer. I've got eye serums. I've got all of these things happening. And also, I don't know if you've seen my father and my mother, but they both look amazing for their age. That's genetics too. But I'm not going to tell you, oh, I just get lots of sleep and drink lots of water because I don't do enough of either of those things. But I am blessed with good genetics, but I also have really deliberately started taking care of my face and it's become a nightly ritual. Everyone else can piss off. I'm going to take 15 minutes to just look after myself. I, I need to, and I, I'm loving it. I'm enjoying it so much, I have to tell you. 
So that's my skin stuff because so many of you have been asking. But you are worth going to just go see a great facial person or, or go, go see a dermo or whatever and find out what your skin type is and what you need. And I'm all about looking as good as I can for my age. I don't want to look, you know, like all tight and weird and bubbly, but I do want to look great for 43. That's it. That's all I want to remind you to sign up for our newsletter because you'll get all the recommendations there and lots of other things. Sign up for Instagram. If you're not following us on Instagram, at Emsolation Podcast. My daughter, Marcella, is a social media captain. She puts a lot of work in. And also, if you're feeling helpless and powerless and want to donate to a reproductive health care charity in the States, Chella will have all the links up on our socials. Ben will also put the links in our Instagram. I'm not going to bother doing it now because you'll forget. I want to put it in a place where you can just click a link and donate money or time or donate your platform, however you want to help. Um... Is, I think that's best. That's what works for me. And just a reminder, also, I'm on the project this Friday night. I'm also on next Wednesday and next Thursday. I know. It's an M on the project, Bonanza. That's all from me. Have a great week and um, look after yourselves. Be kind. Pop a serum on if you need to, whatever you need. Get a sheet mask from Coles if that's all you want. Okay. Well, not necessarily Coles. It can be from anywhere. I don't know. I'm not promoting Coles. Unless they want me to, but I'm not. Wherever. All right, gang. Chat soon. Bye. Emsolation with M. Rossiano is a Spotify exclusive podcast recorded at Down the Hill Studios, hosted by M. Rossiano with Michael Lucas. Executive produced by Benjamin Wosley. Produced by M. Rossiano. Edited by Ezekiel Fenn at Entente Music. With videos by James Henderson. Socials by Marcella Rossiano Barrow. With assistance from Jem Evans and Georgia Watts, plus occasional off-a-shelf installs and flat-pack wrangling from M's dad, Vincy. Get more m by following us on Instagram at m Podcast. You can also sign up for our weekly newsletter, join other m of the m group on Facebook, the answer is Harry Styles. And please, take the time to share this podcast with a friend and make sure you're following us on the Spotify app by hitting the follow button. Thanks again for taking time out to listen to this week's episode and we look forward to chatting with you again soon.